Welcome to chapter 15 and Things Fall Apart. You recall that Akanku is now in Mbanta and um, his uncle Luchendu is kind of looking after him and the family and he's got to stay there for seven years because of his accidental killing of this clansman. It was in the second year of Akanko's exile that his friend Obierica came to visit him. He brought with him two young men, each of them carrying a heavy bag on his head. Akanko helped them put down their loads. It was clear that the bags were full of calories. Akanko was very happy to receive his friend. His wives and children were very happy too, and so were his cousins and their wives when he sent for them and told them who his guest was. You must take him to salute our father, said one of the cousins. Yes, replied Akanko, we are going directly. But before they went, he whispered something to his first wife. She nodded, and soon the children were chasing one of their cocks. So he's going to have kind of a chicken feast for these guys. Uchendu had been told by one of those grandchildren that three strangers had come to Akanko's house. He was therefore waiting to receive them. He held out his hands to them, and they came into his obi, and after they had shaken hands, he asked Akanko who they were. This is Obi Erika, my great friend. I have already spoken to you about him. Yes, said the old man, turning to Obi Erika. My son has told me about you, and I am happy you have come to see us. I knew your father, Iweka. He was a great man. He had many friends here and came to see them quite often. Those were good days when a man had friends in distant clans. Your generation does not know that. You stay at home afraid of your next-door neighbor. Even a man's motherland is strange to him nowadays. He looked at a conquo. I am an old man, and I like to talk. That is all I am good for now. He got up painfully, went into an inner room, and came back with a, co with a cola nut. So he's basically chastising this younger generation for kind of staying at home and not really visiting anymore. And then, you know... That happens today where, you know, a grandparent will say something like, you know, back in my day we used to, and then they'd go on and on about the stuff that they did that we no longer do anymore. And so that's really all um, Uchendu is doing here. Of course, it is interesting that he mentions that you don't visit anymore, and we know that Akankwa hasn't visited his motherland since his mother died, and so it kind of hits close to home, which is why Uchendo very quickly changes the subject and then goes to get the colon up. Who are the young men with you? he asked as he sat down again on his goatskin. Akankwa told him. Ah, he said, welcome, my sons. He presented the cola up to them, and when they had seen it and thanked him, he broke it and they ate. Go into that room, he said to Akankwo, pointing with his finger. You will find a pot of wine there. Akankwo brought the wine and they began to drink. It was a day old and very strong. Yes, said Uchindu after a long silence. People traveled more in those days. There is not a single clan in these parts that I do not know very well. Aninta, Umuazu, Ekeocha, Enumelu, Abame, I know them all. Have you heard? asked Obierka, that Abame is no more. How is that? asked Uchendu and Okanko together. Abame has been wiped out, said Obierka. It is a strange and terrible story. If I had not seen the few survivors with my own eyes and heard their story with my own ears, I would not have believed. Was it not on Eke Day that they fled into Umuafia? he asked his two companions, and they nodded their heads. So he's going to tell the story of this village of Abame and how it was wiped out. Three moons ago, said Obierka, on an Eke market day, a little band of fugitives came into our town. Most of them were sons of our land whose mothers had been buried with us. But there were some too who came because they had friends in our town, and others who could think of nowhere else open to escape. And so they fled into Umuafia with a woeful story. He drank his palm wine, and Akanku filled his horn again. He continued, During the last planting season, a white man had appeared in their clan. An albino? suggested Akanku. He was not an albino. He was quite different. He sipped his wine, and he was riding an iron horse. The first people who saw him ran away, 
but he stood beckoning to them. In the end, the fearless ones went near and even touched him. The elders consulted their oracle, and it told them that the strange man would break their clan and spread destruction among them. Obierica again drank a little of his wine. And so they killed the white man and tied his iron horse to their sacred tree because it looked as if it would run away to call the man's friends. I forgot to tell you another thing which the oracle said. He said that other white men were on their way. They were locusts, it said, and the first man was their harbinger sent to explore the terrain, and so they killed him. So, this is a very interesting passage here. A white man shows up in Avonlea, and he's riding an iron horse. This iron horse is a bicycle. Okay, this is the late 1800s, so they didn't have motorcycles or anything like that at this time. So he's riding a bicycle, and the oracle tells him that this guy is like a messenger of these other white men. So it's kind of like the locusts. And you remember in the part one, there was a chapter where the locusts came, and we talked about that being foreshadowing. And this is what it foreshadowed. What did the white man say before they killed him? asked Uchendu. He said nothing, answered one of Obierka's companions. He said something, only they did not understand him, said Obierka. He seemed to speak through his nose. One of the men told me, said Obierka's other companion, that he repeated over and over again a word that resembled Imbaino. Perhaps he had been going to Imbaino and had lost his way. In this account of, the, of what's gone on here in Abame is... Um, it actually relates to a real life incident. And we'll talk about that in class a little bit more. But this is based in an actual event that really did happen. Anyway, resumed Obierka, they killed him and tied up his iron horse. This was before the planting season began. For a long time, nothing happened. The rains had come and yams had been sown. The iron horse was still tied to the sacred silk cotton tree. And then one morning, Three white men, led by a band of ordinary men like us, came to the clan. They saw the iron horse and went away again. Most of the men and women of Abame had gone to their farms. Only a few of them saw these white men and their followers. For many market weeks, nothing else happened. They have a big market in Abame on every other Afo day, and as you know, the clan gathers there. That was the day it happened. The three white men and a very large number of other men surrounded the market. They must have used a powerful medicine to make themselves invisible until the market was full. And they began to shoot. Everybody was killed except the old and the sick who were at home and a handful of men and women whose chi were wide awake and brought them out of that market. He paused. Their clan is now completely empty. Even the sacred fish in their mysterious lake have fled, and the lake has turned the color of blood. A great evil has come upon their land, as the oracle had warned. So just like the foreshadowing of the locusts, the locusts are a destructive force, and the white men, the colonists, as we'll find out, are also a destructive force in this novel. There was a long silence. Uchendu ground his teeth together audibly. Then he burst out, Never kill a man who says nothing. Those men of Abame were fools. What do they know about the man? He ground his teeth again and told a story to illustrate his point. Mother Kite once sent her daughter to bring food. She went and brought back a duckling. You have done very well, said Mother Kite to her daughter. But tell me, what did the mother of this duckling say when you swooped and carried its child away? It said nothing, replied the young kite. It just walked away. You must return the duckling, said Mother Kite. There is something ominous behind the silence. And so daughter kite returned the duckling and took a chick instead. What did the mother of this chick do, asked the old kite. It cried and raved and cursed me, said the young kite. Then we can eat the chick, said her mother. There is nothing to fear from someone who shouts. Those men of Abame were fools. They were fools, said Akanko after a pause. They had been warned that danger was ahead. 
They should have armed themselves with their guns and their machetes, even when they went to market. So you can see that Uchendu is kind of a wise and thoughtful person. A Conquo, true to form, was ready to fight. He thought, oh, well, they should have gone armed to this marketplace, and then they could have defended themselves. They have paid for their foolishness, said Obierica, but I am greatly afraid. We have heard stories about white men who made the powerful guns and the strong drinks and took slaves away across the seas, but no one thought the stories were true. So they heard about these white people that were taking slaves and everything, but nobody believed the stories. So it would be very similar if um, somebody came running in to, um, to talk to us and they said, oh, there were aliens on Main Street and they came down and they abducted a few townspeople. We would laugh and say, ah, ha, 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 that's some silly stuff. You know, we don't believe you. And that's the same thing that's gone on here. There is no story that is not true, said Uchendu. The world has no end, and what is good among one people is an abomination of with others. We have albinos among us. Do you not think that they came to our clan by mistake, that they have strayed from their way to a land where everybody is like them? Akanko's first wife soon finished her cooking and set before their guests a big meal of pounded yams and bitter leaf soup. Akankwo's son, Nwoye, brought in a pot of sweet wine tapped from the raffia palm. You are a big man now, Obierka said to Nwoye. Your friend and Nene asked me to greet you. Is he well? asked Nwoye. We are all well, said Obierka. Azinma brought them a bowl of water with which to wash their hands. After that, they began to eat and to drink the wine. When did you set out from home? asked Akankwo. We had meant to set out from my house before cock crow, said Obierka, but Inweke did not appear until it was quite light. Never make an early morning appointment with a man who has just married a new wife. And they all laughed. Has Inweke married a wife? asked Akankwo. He has married Okadibo's second daughter, said Obierka. That is very good, said Akankwo. I do not blame you for not hearing the cock crow. When they had eaten, Obierka pointed at the two heavy bags. That is the money from your yams, he said. I sold the big ones as soon as you left. Later on, I sold some of the seed yams and gave out others to sharecroppers. I shall do that every year until you return. But I thought you would need the money now, and so I brought it. Who knows what may happen tomorrow? Perhaps green men will come to our clan and shoot us. God will not permit it, said Akankwo. I do not know how to thank you. I can tell you, said Obierka, kill one of your sons for me. Well, that will not be enough, said Okonkwo. Then kill yourself, said Obierka. Forgive me, said Okonkwo, smiling. I shall not talk about thanking you anymore. So it's a fun little uh, joke that they tell at the end of that chapter about thanking each other. So Obierka doesn't want to be thanked for helping his friend. He's just a really good guy. But the important part of this chapter is that they're hearing stories now that white people are showing up in their area and they're dangerous. They have killed these people of Abame. They massacred them. And again, that's based on a true story and everything. So we'll talk about the true story in class. So, until the next time.